it's all organic, um, general, and introductory. Thank you. So I've done this a lot. Um, <clears throat> this is going to be chapter two. Uh, it's going to deal with measurements, uh, simple calculations, and stuff like that. Now, everybody should have got <clears throat> one of these sets of um, slide mini prints. Um, the entire lecture is done uh, using PowerPoint. So <clears throat> the nice thing about these little mini prints is that it means that you don't have to spend so much time sitting there writing down words, because they're all here. Um, you can instead listen, which is better. If you notice, um, as you get in a little bit, there are some that are, seem to be essentially blank, and those are in-class problems. <clears throat> so what you do, um, ideally, is we will put the problem up on the slide, we will work on it, and as we do, well, actually the first thing you're supposed to do is work it on your sheet. Um, teaches you to write very small, but um, it's a very effective way for taking notes, etc. cetera. Um, as we go through these things, <clears throat> we will hit sections to do with tutorials, examples, and whatever. Uh, these are from my website here, chemistryonline.com. It's a nice place to visit if you're taking intro chemistry. Uh, lots and lots of resources. The lecture slides for the entire course, um, the one I teach anyway, are here. Um, exam review slides. Micro tutorials, those are little five minute or so uh, videos uh, to do with a single subject. So for example, significant figures, click on it, listen to me for five minutes, <clears throat> short and to the point. Nice things. Lecture recordings, every word that we say in this classroom is being recorded along with the slides. Um, what this means is that when you're done, um, you can go here, click on this, um, find the link, and it will open a little window, give you a YouTube video of um, everything we said. Again, it'll be the slides, and it'll be my voice and whatever. This is a very, very useful way for um, studying and reviewing. If you don't understand something, you can just go over it again. If you just really enjoyed it, you can just watch it over and over. Uh, the entire set from Spring 14 is there if you want to look at those. Um, textbook, this is the Chemistry Online textbook. It's, um, slight, well, it is different than the one you have. Um, it's an ebook. It's uh, $19, yours is not, and it's very expensive. Um, this is what we use. Um, it was written specifically for the course at UIC and works very, very well. Finally, tutorials here. Um, as you look at your slides, you'll see things with little blue squares in those. Those are tutorial questions. Um, these are algorithmic which means that every time you do it, you will get a different problem. It's a great way to sit and review a concept. We'll see examples of that as we go. Any questions? You just came in, right? Okay, you got your stuff. All right, good. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get started with Chapter 2. Chapter 2 begins just with a discussion of matter. Um, matter basically is any substance that has mass. Remember that mass and weight are different. Matter, we'll see, consists of atoms, which in turn are comprised of protons, electrons, and neutrons. Of these, the protons and the neutrons are confined to the nucleus, and they are surrounded by electrons. 
We've all seen this. It's a very classic um, little image from the 50s, really, of an atom. We have a nucleus, and we have electrons and little orbits around it. We've all seen Jimmy Neutron, um, whatever. So <clears throat> this is the classic 1950s depiction. Well, it's wrong. Um, modern quantum theory says that this does not accurately describe um, an atom on two levels. First of all, the electrons really are not little balls in orbits. Electrons are best described as being a cloud. The cloud surrounds the nucleus. Um, <clears throat> we talk about electron cloud. There'll be a certain number of electrons in here. We don't know where they are, but they're there. This is just defined as a region of space. This is also wrong because the nucleus is very, very large here. In fact, the nucleus is very, very small. <clears throat> I put it here down to one pixel. That's as small as I could get. But even that's wrong. We'll see that in a little bit. This is meant to depict helium. Helium has two protons and two neutrons in its nucleus and it's surrounded by two electrons in this cloud. All right, atoms are incredibly small. If this, in fact, was a copper penny, and it isn't, but if it was, it would contain roughly 28 sextillion copper atoms. <clears throat> Each of these will have protons, neutrons, and electrons. The mass of the proton is about 1.67 times 10 to the minus 24 grams. <coughs> now this is what that really looks like as a decimal number. Lots and lots of zeros in front. <coughs> we'll talk about scientific notation, how to do to and from scientific notation in just a little bit. Just for review though, in case you've already done this, we say this is 10 to the minus 24. What we do is move this decimal point from there all the way to here. That's 24 places. And write it this way. Um, we're going to the right as we move it. That makes it a negative exponent. But we'll do that again in just a minute. Neutron is very similar to a proton as far as mass goes. The electron, however, is much, much less, about a thousandfold less. What this means, actually, is that in an atom, virtually all of the mass for this atom is tied up in this little teeny tiny nucleus in the middle. The electrons contribute virtually nothing to the mass. Again, we'll come back to that. This is Wrigley Field. We have bleachers, we have rooftop bleachers, and this is the golf ball. Just to put the size of the nucleus into perspective, if we had an atom where the electron cloud was the entire size of Wrigley Field, one end to the other, the nucleus this guy would be represented the size of a golf ball sitting on the eight foot. And again, that's virtually all of the mass of this atom. Atoms are essentially empty space. A little tiny nucleus and a big electron cloud. If we have a substance with only one type of atom, that's called an element. Um, <clears throat> in your book, you will deal with periodic table and elements um, in a bit, but we really can't talk about them until we at least introduce the concept. Every element is going to be represented by its own symbol. Um, symbols are then organized in what's known as the periodic table. Periodic table is going to look something like this. 
these are all of our elements. You'll see later that they are organized by atomic number. That's the number of protons in the nucleus. Each of these is represented by a symbol. And as you can see, in many cases, the symbol is a simple derivative of the name. Beryllium, magnesium, carbon, helium, etc. There are, however, guys down here that are a little more challenging. Silver, gold, lead, tin, etc. These are elements that were characterized long, long time ago. And because of that, their symbol was assigned based on Greek or Latin names. So for these guys, it's a little more challenging. You just have to remember those. Once again, your book is going to cover that in a bit. Any questions so far? Well, let's return to our atoms. We put up two numbers here, a very large number and a very small number. 28 sextillion copper atoms in a pen. 10 to the minus 24 grams for a proton. Because chemistry typically is going to deal with these very large numbers, we have to use something to make it a little bit more manageable. We obviously can't be writing stuff like this. And so that's why we use scientific notation. In scientific notation, 28 sextillion would be written as 2.8 times 10 to the 27. That means we have 21 zeros after the 8 here. As we said earlier, mass of a proton is about 1.7 times 10 to the minus 24. So the first thing we're going to do is learn how to take simple numbers and convert them to and from scientific notation. <clears throat> when you do a number in scientific notation, it's going to have two parts, the coefficient and an exponent. To write the coefficient, you simply look at your number and you move your decimal point. If it doesn't have a real decimal point, you move the implied decimal point. But you move it until you wind up with a number between 1 and 10. All right, so you've got a number now between 1 and 10. <clears throat> You're going to move this after the first non-zero digit. Next, you determine how many places you had to move this decimal point. If you're going to move it to the left, your exponent will be positive. If you had to move it to the right, it will be negative. Now, writing numbers in scientific notation is very important in chemistry. It's kind of like breathing. So make sure that you get the concept. If we had 950,000, and we were going to write this in scientific notation, first thing we'd say is, well, there's no real decimal point, is there? But there's an implied decimal point here. And because there's an implied decimal point, this is where we're going to start. Our first rule says we write our coefficient as a number between 1 and 10, so we're going to move our decimal here between the 9 and the 5 and write 9.5. Now in order to do this, we had to start here and move this implied decimal point 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 spots. We're moving it to the left, so our coefficient is going to be positive. So this is going to be 9.5 times 10 to the fifth. Now that's simple, isn't it? Uh -huh. Oh, do you have one? Yeah. Oh, okay. 
<clears throat> Any questions? All right, well, let's go ahead and do a set. In your handout, you should have this list of numbers. Very quickly run through and convert all of these to scientific notation. While you do, I will just pace back and forth for a moment. we're going to do these one at a time. Our first number here, we're going to move this real decimal point in between the 2 and the 5. We're going to write all the real digits we have, so this is 2.57. In order to get that, we had to take the decimal point and move it to the right one, two places. If you go to the right, it's a negative. So this is 2.57 times 10 to the minus 2. Our next one here, 125.6. We're going to move this decimal point in between the 1 and the 2. In order to get that, we have to move the decimal point two places to the left. So that's a positive exponent. 1.256 times 10 squared. Our next one is 93 million. Now we have no real decimal point here, but we have the implied decimal point at the end. <clears throat> We're going to move that decimal point in between the 9 and the 3. And in order to get that, we had to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 places. <coughs> Going to the left, and that is 10 to the plus 7. Makes no difference if it's plus or minus. We're going to do the same operation. Starting out here, we're going to move our implied decimal between the 5 and the 6. Keep our negative sign, of course. To do that, we had to go one, two, three, four places. Ten. <coughs> and our last one. <clears throat> Going to start out here. Move our decimal between the two and the seven. In order to do that, we had to go to the right. One, two, three, four, five, six. Is that right? Yep, six places. Sometimes you stand so close to the slide you can't see it very well. Any questions? Well, like I said, this is like breathing. You need to be able to breathe in and breathe out. So let's do it backwards. Take these and write them into decimal format. Five, 2.57 times 10 squared. <clears throat> Think about it this way. 10 squared is 100, isn't it? 2.57 times 100 is 257. 
I can do that. This is 10 to the minus 7. So we're going to start here and move our decimal point over here to the left this way. We're going to go and we're going to put six zeros in front. One to get in front of the one, and then six more zeros to give us minus seven. Now we also stick a zero in front of the decimal because that's just good form. You don't include that when you're doing the exponents. 10 to the minus 4, that means we're going to have three zeros in front of here. Now this one is interesting. <clears throat> we're going to take 6.580000 and multiply it by 10 to the 4th. That means we're going to move this decimal point four places. One, two, three, four. Now that's going to put it right here, isn't it? So the number we would write would look like this. Now we'll see that that's very important because what this tells us is the number of significant figures. And we're going to talk about that in just a few minutes. Is that a question? Finally, 278 times 10 to the minus 1. We're going to go this away, one space, one point, and we get point 278. Any questions? Well, like I said, <clears throat> um, on the Chemistry Online site, there are tutorials. And this is a screenshot of the tutorial page. The one we're going to look at right now is scientific and decimal notation, followed by exponents. Again, the neat thing about these is that every time you click the button, you get a new problem. And it will also explain to you, if you get it wrong, exactly what you did wrong. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and look at the scientific notation tutorial. All in the world this does is it gives you a number. In this case it asks you to convert it to scientific notation. So go ahead and take this number 83000000 and rewrite it in scientific notation. My coefficient is simply going to be 8.3. In order to get 8.3, we had to move the implied decimal point. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven places. So this is 10 to the plus 7. Oh, it has positive reinforcement. It tells you that you got it right. Point oh four six. Quickly write that as scientific notation. See how the slides teach you to write so very small. We're going to put 4.6 as our coefficient. In order to get that, we had to move to the right two places, so less than minus two. Write the decimal equivalent of 7.1 times 10 to the minus 7. Well, we're going to have 7.1, and we're going to have a string of zeros in front, right? This is 10 to the minus 7, so you're talking six zeros in front, decimal point, and then one more zero.
Convert this to decimal. 5.6910 to the 7. Write our 5.6 here. I'm going to follow the 6 with 6 more zeros. And finally, <clears throat> go ahead and convert this to scientific notation. My coefficient is simply going to be 6.1. In order to get there, we had to move to the right. One, two, three, four, five, six places. So let's say minus six. Now you may have noticed, in fact I pointed out, on the tutorial page, there's also something called exponents under math review. Um, let's just look at a couple of those just to make sure that everybody's up to speed handling calculations with exponents, because we do this a lot, a lot. The problem is we have 5.15 times 10 to the minus fifth. We're going to multiply it by 5.58 times 10 to the fifth. Now that's going to give you some number. If you write that number in scientific notation, it's going to have an exponent. So the tutorial simply wants you to do this calculation and then write the exponent only of the answer. So let's just see how we do this. We have 10 to the minus fifth multiplied by 10 to the plus fifth. When you multiply, exponents add. Okay? Exponents add. So, plus 5, minus 5, that's a 0. Next, you look at the coefficients. Basically, you have 5 times 5. That's 25, isn't it? Now, that's going to give us 1 extra power 10. So, the exponents gave us 0 from our 25, or actually 28.7. We get one more power of 10. So, in the final answer, our exponent is 1. Right there. Let me hush for a second. You do this one. We're doing division here. When you do division, exponents subtract. Multiplication they add, division they subtract. So we have 10 to the minus 13 minus a minus 4. It's plus 4, isn't it? Gives us a total of minus 9. Next, we look at the coefficient. We have 1 divided by 4. That's about 0.25. Actually, it's about 0.4. But that's less than 1, isn't it? So that puts in one additional negative exponent. So instead of minus 9, include this one. We're at minus 10. Last one. Division again. 10 to the 19th minus a minus 10. 
minus a minus 10 is plus 10, isn't it? So we're at 29. 1.8 divided by 1 is 1 1.8, so that's no change. And our exponent is 29. Now, if you're at all unclear on any of these concepts, I urge you to please go to the site. <clears throat> it's chemistryonline.com, and you can sit and you can practice these until you get it. Any questions? Another thing that pops up, <clears throat> um, since I'm not really your instructor, but when you do five of them and you get them right, a little box will pop up down here that will let you send your instructor an email. So you could type in your instructor's name, you know, email address. It will send a thing to the instructor saying, that you have successfully completed X number in the X marks. All right. Let's go ahead and look at the concept of significant figures. Significant figures are very closely tied to measurement. <clears throat> this is oh, a little volumetric flask sitting on a balance. You're going to do something like that on Wednesday. This is the mass in grams. This is 58.7298 grams. Uh, yes, the um, balances really can be that accurate. <clears throat> this last digit here, however, isn't quite real. It's the machine's best guess as to what the last digit is. The rest of these are all real. This one isn't. It's the best guess. Now, the best way to show this, I think, is to do a very analog experiment here. Here's a ruler, and this is a little red arrow. I'm going to ask you, where is the red arrow pointing? Okay. <clears throat> well, again, that's not difficult. You look at it, this is 50, 55. So it's between 54 and 55. Now, you're sure that it's at least 54, aren't you? You know that for a fact. You can see. It's at least 54. Not 55, it's somewhere in between. So you give it your best guess. You say this is oh, about 54.5. The last digit is our best guess. If I were to report this as 54, that would be wrong. Because it's more than that. And if I reported it as 54.666667, that would be stupid. Because there's no way you know that. Only thing you know is that it's about 0.5. This number has three significant figures. The first two digits we're sure of. The last one is our best guess. Any measurement in science, the last digit is going to be the best guess. To get numbers of significant figures, all you do is simply count the digits in the measurement. Now that's simple, we can do that. The only place people have trouble with significant figures is if you have zeros in your number. And so there are rules for that. First thing you do is you look at your number, your measurement, and you say, does it end with a decimal point? 
doesn't have a decimal point in it. If it does, <clears throat> the zeros in front of the real digits are never, ever significant. Those are called leading zeros. They're not real. Any zeros after the digits are real. Those count as significant figures. And if you take a zero and stick it between real digits, of course, that is significant. So that's if we have a decimal point. If you don't, trailing zeros, that is, zeros after the number, are not significant at all. Don't count at all. And once again, any time you have a zero in between real digits, it's real. So, 3,400. How many significant figures? That's right. Step one, we look and say, no decimal point. Because there's no decimal point, that means that the zeros after the digits don't count. We're left with only two digits and two significant figures. Zero point zero 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 one zero. Step one, does it have a decimal point? Yes, it does. These are leading zeros, aren't they? Because it has a decimal point, leading zeros are never significant. Second, because it has a decimal point, this trailing zero is significant. That means we have two significant figures. Zero point zero 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 one zero six. Step one, we have a decimal point. So our leading zeros go away. Here we have a zero in between real digits, and because of that, they're all real, and there are three significant. Twenty fifty. No decimal point. That means our trailing zero is going to go away. This zero is in between real digits, so it's real. Get rid of that one, and we're left with. How about 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd? Well, here's a number written in scientific notation, right? <clears throat> what this number really is, is this. Now it has no zero or no decimal, does it? So that means that all of these go away. This is in between real things, so this has three significant figures. Whenever you have a number written in scientific notation, the coefficient contains all of the significant figures. All the significant figures go into the coefficient. Doesn't matter if it has 12 of them. You would put 12 digits in your coefficient. Let's do a quick set. 
Take these, convert them to scientific notation again, and include the proper number of significant figures. Point zero two five seven. As a decimal, these two are not significant, are they? The leadings are not. So we have three significant figures. We have to move our decimal point two places, making it ten to the minus two. Our next number one two five point six. Have a decimal point, don't have zeros to worry about at all, do we? So this is going to be four significant figures. Have to move our decimal point two places over. 1.256 times 10 squared. 93 million again. <clears throat> no decimal point, not significant. <clears throat> Going to write 9.3, two significant figures, times 10 to the 7th. Now think about this one here. In this guy, we did a measurement. We determined that something was exactly minus 65,800, and the last digit was darn near zero. So we put a zero in as our estimate. That means that all of these are significant figures, right? So they all must go into the coefficient. We're going to have to move this one, two, three, four places. But we have to include this last zero, total of one, two, three, four, five, six digits. It's real, it's got to be it. Finally, these are all leading zeros. We get rid of them. 278, that's three significant figures, times 10 to the minus 6. Quickly do it backwards. Should be able to do this very quickly now. This tells us we have three significant figures. Going to multiply it by 10 squared. We have three significant figures. Going to put six zeros in front. We have two significant figures. Going to put three zeros in front. Now look at this one. <clears throat> 10 to the fourth is our exponent. So we're going to move it one, two, three, four to right there. The last two digits here are part of the measurement, and they're real. And the last one, three significant figures, 0.278. Now you know there's lots of ways that you can test for significant figures. Probably the most boring is to put a number up and say, how many significant figures are there? Okay. Probably one of the more interesting ones that I put on an exam back at UIC 
What's this one? Take these and arrange them from the greatest number of significant figures to the least. Which number is going to have the most? 809,000. Well, this has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. This is a decimal point, though, too, isn't it? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Now comes the other one. What's next in line? This guy here is only going to have two, isn't it? Because the leading zeros are going to go away. But this one has one, two, three, four, five. So what's next? This one has no decimal point, trailing zeros go, that one stays, and there's four significant. This one, last digit goes, we're left with three. And finally, this guy at the top has two significant figures. Now, wasn't that more fun? Now, if you want practice on this, of course, there's a tutorial. It simply gives you a number and asks you to type in the number of significant figures. We look at this and we say it has no decimal, so those trailing zeros go. We're left with these three, three significant figures. <coughs> Has a decimal, does it? <clears throat> no, it has no leading zeros to worry about, but it has trailing zeros. With a decimal point, the trailing zeros count. <coughs> this is eight significant. This one, you should get as fast as you can read it, is scientific notation. We know that in scientific notation, the coefficient contains all the significant figures. One more. <clears throat> 0 0.070. As a decimal point. So we get rid of all the leading zeros. But because it has a decimal point, this one stays, and we have two significant figures. Now, you know, why do we worry so much about significant figures? <clears throat> well, science has done is based on measurements, isn't it? And we're going to do lots of measurements. You have to be able to report them so that people know exactly what you've measured. Not only that, but quite often you will take your measurements and you will use them as part of a calculation. 
significant digits, and calculations. There are two rules. The first one doesn't make sense to most people. That's why it's first. If you're doing addition and subtraction, you don't want to look at the numbers and say, how many significant figures here, how many here? We don't care about that. All you do is you look to see if you have a decimal point. And if you do, how many digits there are <coughs> after the decimal point. So you take your number, once you're adding, you say so many decimal points or so many digits after the decimal, so many digits after the decimal, you take the least in your answer. Multiplication and division makes more sense. You simply look at the number of significant figures in each. Your answer has the fewest of the two. So if I'm adding 1.455 or 3.2. Rule number one. I have three digits after my decimal point. I have one digit after my decimal point. That means my answer, in spite of what the calculator says, must be rounded to one digit after the decimal point. So the way you do this in real life is you do it on your calculator, get the number, and then round it to one digit after the decimal point. Again, we're doing addition. Two digits, two digits. Our answer must have two digits after the decimal point. Multiplication. Now is when you look at significant figures in each number. Here we have a decimal point, so this is three, isn't it? Decimal point, no leading, this is 2. We multiply these together, calculator says 2 point or 0.294. We must round this to two significant figures or 0.29. Now is when it gets fun. What if you're doing compound calculations? And I assure you before the end of the course, you will. Well, what you're going to do here is do each set of operations separately, following our rules, and then round your answer. In our numerator here, we have 6.023. How many significant figures is that? That's a 4. And then we have 1,000. How many is that? 1. Our denominator here has 3 significant figures. Our calculator just spit out this answer. Quickly. Round this to one significant figure. Well, 0 0.038 blah, 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 is going to round to 0 0.04. One significant figure. Because that's what we have up here. Let's do one more just to make life complicated. Now in 
instead of a comma, I have a decimal point. My numerator is subtraction. And then I'm doing division. What you want to do here is to do each operation separately. For our numerator, we have three places, three places. Punch it in your calculator, you get an answer. Make sure that answer is three digits after the decimal. Once you get that, then you simply divide by 23.0. This is your calculator answer. How are we going to round this? When we did our operation in the numerator, this subtraction, the answer we got was 5.022. Three digits after the decimal. It's the numerator. Now we ask the question, how many significant figures do we have? This is 4. That's 5. So our answer must be rounded to 4. Take this, <clears throat> take a breath, round it to 4 significant. Let's go in here four places. One, two, three, four. We're looking at three, two, aren't we? Two is less than five. So this is going to round <coughs> down to three. Any questions on the concept here? As, well, let me just say as an editorial that everybody dislikes significant figures. They do. It's a bother. It really is. But it's one of those things that you have to do if you're going to report information and do it properly. All right, would you like to take about five minutes or so, and then we'll come back and we will do the metric system. <clears throat> if you haven't signed the attendance sheet, please do that. In my classes, I never take attendance. <clears throat> But you should know better. Here is right to get my kids. Plus, if you want to see it, I think it's just a good time for you. The traditional English system of measurement is based on bizarre things like the length of somebody's foot, their finger. All of this nonsense. For science, that really just doesn't work. Okay? You need something firm. <clears throat> a meter is defined as some multiple of a certain wavelength of light. So this is a fundamental measurable item. In the metric system, we're going to use these fundamental measurements fundamental units to represent length, mass, and volume. <clears throat> for length, the defined standard for length in the SI, that's International System of Units, SI is a meter. So everything is related to this unit that's a meter. 
it's about 39 inches or something like that. But that doesn't matter. <clears throat> a meter. We can take the meter and we can divide it into 100 pieces. When we do that, we get a centimeter. We abbreviate that as CM. We'll see why in just a second. For mass, the standard unit is a kilogram. Now, most people get that wrong. <clears throat> they think the standard unit is a gram, but actually a gram is one one thousandth of a kilogram. And for volume, it's even stranger. A cubic meter is an SI standard. So that's a cube that's one meter on a side. <clears throat> we will use probably won't use cubic meter ever. Cubic centimeter is a cube one centimeter on a side. In the metric system, we're going to take these standards, meter, gram, and we're going to use these to define our measurements. We're going to do this by including the unit of measure we're dealing with, so meter, for example, and a prefix. Now the prefix is shorthand for exponential notation. So if we write a prefix of C, that's a shorthand for 10 to the minus 2. For example, if we have a millimeter, so a meter is this long, milli is shorthand, deviation of L, for 10 to the minus 3. So what this really is, is 1 times 10 to the minus 3 meters. And you write this shorthand as simply millimeter, 10 to the minus 3 meter. If you wanted to do picometer, you would use P for 10 to the minus 12. PM means 10 to the minus 12 meter. And down here, K for kilo. That's a shortcut for 10 to the third. A kilometer is 10 to the third meters. So it's a real nice, compact, shorthand way of doing things. <clears throat> One of the things that we do in intro is we are presented with measurements. <clears throat> Quite often, you have to convert these from one set of metric measurements into another. What we're going to do is to use the basic definition of the metric system and these prefixes to set up simple ratios that are going to allow us to do this very quickly and very easily. Previously, we saw that a thousand millimeters was one meter, right? Milli is 10 to the minus 3. 10 to the minus 3 times 1,000 is 1. If I wanted to express this number as a ratio, I could do it like this. I could say 1 meter is the same as 1,000 millimeters. Now, why does that work? Because the number milli is 10 to the minus 3. So 10 to the third times 10 to the minus 3 is 1. Over here, 1 millimeter, 10 to the minus 3 meters. That's because milli is 10 to the minus 3. These are simply those guys turned upside down. So for every metric in a conversion, in this case from millimeters to meters, you could write four of these ratios. And we're going to learn how to use these ratios in a very simple algorithm to do these interconversions. But first, 
let's practice writing a ratio. Dew meter to picometer. I want you to give me two ratios related to those. Step one, you have to remember all this. Or you can just look at your sheets on that. Then you have to find pico. <clears throat> pico is a little p. And it's 10 to the minus 12, isn't it? So we could write two ratios in. We could write four. But two of them that we could write would be these. If we had 10 to the 12 pico meters, that would be one meter. That works because this is 10 to the minus 12, 10 to the 12, and that gives you one. We can also say that one picometer is 10 to the minus 12 meters. And that's simply because pico is shorthand for 10 to the minus 12. Let's do another one. Meters and micrometers. OK, where's micro on this list? Micro is the Greek symbol mu. And it stands for 10 to the minus 6. could say <clears throat> if we had 10 to the 6 micrometers, that would be the same as 1 meter. 10 to the 6 multiplied by 10 to the minus 6 is 1. 1 meter. We can also say 1 micrometer is this. That's because micro is shorthand for 10 to the minus 6. Do one more just because it's fun? No, I guess we're not. All right, enough fun. <clears throat> what am I going to do with these ratios? Well, I'm going to show you a simple algorithm that actually could take you all the way through intro chemistry, general chemistry, and even into physical chemistry. It's a very, very simple approach to problem solving. It's referred to as given ratio. And that's going to equal whatever it is you're trying to find. All these numbers that we're going to be dealing with have units. The only trick to this is to look at your problem, identify what number you're given, and what the units are. Then you come up with a ratio. Rule is, whatever the units are for given, you must put them in the denominator of your ratio. OK. If you are given meters, some number of meters, and you want to ask to convert this to kilometers, what you're given would be meter, wouldn't it? What ratio that we could write for kilometers? We could say that one kilometer is the same as 10 to the third meters. And to use this, we simply need to make sure meter, which matches given, is in the denominator. Let's do a real example. If I say I have 6,023 kilometers, 
convert that to meters. Well, step one, what's given? 6,023. A ratio. We need a ratio relating meters and kilometers, don't we? And of course, we're trying to find meters. Now I've just written down two ratios here. This is our given. So you start off just by writing the given. Next, we're going to stick in a ratio that's going to relate meters and kilometers. You do that, one kilometer is a thousand meters, a thousand meters and a kilometer. We can do that. But the ratio we choose must have kilometers in the denominator. So we're going to use this guy. Now, if you look at it, kilometers are going to cancel, aren't they? And we're left only with meters. Given ratio 5. So you do the simple math. Feed it to your calculator. 6,023 times 1,000. 6.023 times 10 to the 6. We are given millimeters. That's our given. And we want to wind up with micrometers. Oh my goodness. Well, what we're going to do is stick in two ratios. One that goes from millimeters to meters, and then one that goes from meters to micrometers. So, our given, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 7 millimeters. I've written two ratios here. The first one <clears throat> relates millimeters and meters. There are 1,000 millimeters in every meter. Our second one relates micrometers in meters. Micro, remember, is short for 10 to the minus 6. But we're going to do this the same way. We're going to start with our given. We need a ratio here for millimeters. And millimeter must be in the denominator. So this ratio here works. Now, if you look here, millimeters are going to cancel, aren't they? This lump, after we do the cancellation, is now the new given. And what are the units of our new given? Meter. That means our next ratio must have meter in the denominator. This one works. 
our meters here are going to cancel, and we're left only with micrometers. Once you get it set up, all you have to do once again is feed it to your calculator. 1.6 times 10 to the minus 7 divided by 10 to the third divided by 10 to the minus 6. You get 1.6 times 10 to the minus 4 micrometers. You can use this approach for anything that has units. Instead of a metric conversion, let's do feet and inches. We're all so familiar with feet and inches. <clears throat> Sometimes doing it this way just makes it really simple for you. What's the given here? 6.8. Right. <clears throat> Ratio, how many feet or how many inches in a foot? Twelve. That's a ratio of twelve. So while I stand here and pace back and forth, write down given, multiply it by the appropriate ratio, and find inches. Our given is 6.8. in our denominator, don't we? Feet cancel, we're left only with inches. Multiply it out, 6.8 times 12, 82. Let's do one more that's mixed. Pounds and grams. <clears throat> now, Professor Bonner told me that he was not going to require you to memorize these sorts of things. That on an exam, he would give it to you. He would tell you that one pound is 454 grams. All right, so our given here, it's going to be four and a half pounds, isn't it? Our ratio, we're going to convert this into a ratio, one pound, 454. <clears throat> you write your given. ratio must have pounds in the denominator. So this one that we wrote, that works. Pounds cancel, and we're left with grams. All in the world you have to do is multiply it out, and you get 2,043 grams. Is this the right answer? Even though it's in red, could still be wrong. How many significant figures do we have here? Three. Three also here. This is actually a definition. 
So you don't include any of these when you fiddle with um, significant figures. Those are definitions. So we have three significant figures. We have to round this to what? 2,040, or 2.04 times 2 to the Now this is actually a problem from your book, this one right here. But, for some reason, instead of using this simple definition of pound and grams, he does pounds to kilograms. But that's okay, we can do that. All this means, however, is that we need two ratios. <coughs> pounds and kilograms one, and then kilograms to grams. We know kilo is a thousand, so there's a thousand grams in a kilogram. So the players are going to look like this. Our given is still 4.5 pounds. <clears throat> Convert this thing into a ratio. A kilogram, 2.2 pounds. This guy simply says 1,000 grams in a kilogram. Now let's string them together. Put down the given. <clears throat> Our first ratio. Kilograms to pounds. Pound must be in the denominator. Given now as units of kilograms. Our second ratio must have kilogram in the denominator. And this one does. And we're left only If you have your calculator out, go ahead and run this. <clears throat> because doing string operations is something that's very important. And it's the kind of thing that you have to do on your personal calculator. Because every calculator does it differently. You want to take 4.5 divided by 2.2046 multiplied by 1,000. Again, this is a definition. Doesn't count. Doesn't count for significant figures. Only the 4.5. And if everything is right for the world, you should get. 2,040 grams. Now you see, if you just did that and it worked, don't you feel good? Instant gratification. Let's look at a tutorial or two. Once again, you can get to these on the Chemistry Online website. Here you're asked to convert a whole bunch of milligrams into pounds. You are given one pound or 54 grams. What we're going to have to do is convert milligrams here to grams, aren't we? Hmm. 
milli is 10 to the minus 3. <coughs> so there are 1,000 milligrams in every gram. So that's one ratio you need to set up. 1,000 milligrams, 1 gram. The other ratio you need to set up is grams to pounds. And that's simply 454 to 1. So our ratios are going to look like this. 1,000 milligrams in a gram, or 54 grams in a pound. We start off with our given here, this whole bunch of milligrams. Now you'll know if this is our first ratio, and I wrote this thing upside down, didn't I? Is that a problem? No. Because it's equal to 1. You can just flip it over anytime you want. So we're going to take and flip this guy over, multiply it by our given. Now, milligrams are going to cancel. Our units of given are now grams. Now, because I'm running out of space, I went ahead and just did the calculation here. When you do this, you get 1.38 times 10 to the third grams. Now, grams is a given, so this ratio must have grams in our denominator. So again, I flipped it up, flipped it upside down. I can do that. Grams are not going to cancel. And you get pounds. Any questions? The temperature. Here in the United States, <clears throat> we tend to measure things in Fahrenheit. I really don't know why, but we do. In Fahrenheit, water freezes at 32 and it boils at 212. There's 180 degrees between the two of them. In science, we're going to measure things using degrees centigrade. In centigrade, water freezes at zero and boils at 100. <clears throat> now there's 180 little degrees here, and there's 100 here. So every centigrade is 1.8 Fahrenheit. Not only that, but look here. Centigrade starts off at zero. Fahrenheit, for some reason, starts off at 32. So the uncomfortable thing here is that we're going to have to subtract 32 degrees from Fahrenheit in order to do the inner conversions. This kind of makes it a little bit complicated. Therefore, we're going to simply use um, some formulas to do this. We can do this with the ratio method, but it gets a little bit cumbersome to explain. <clears throat> Again, we're going to have to add or subtract 32 because these guys start off at different places. So, let's say that we were given something in Fahrenheit, and we wanted to convert that, oh no, 
how about we were given something in centigrade and we wanted to convert that into Fahrenheit. What we would do would be to simply take our centigrade number, multiply it by 1.8. 1.8, well, because every degree centigrade is 1.8 Fahrenheit, isn't it? But because they start off in different spots, we have to add in 32. For example, if we had 32 Fahrenheit, or if we had zero degrees centigrade, going a long way here, sorry, times 1.8, that's still zero, isn't it? Add up 32, we get 32 Fahrenheit. Zero centigrade, 32 Fahrenheit. Any questions? <clears throat> right, take this formula and write it on your forearm. If we want to go from Fahrenheit to centigrade, we are going to take our Fahrenheit number and subtract 32 from it. Then we're going to divide it by our 1.8 and get centigrade. Now, like I said, you can do the ratio method here. The ratio method, the ratio we would use, would be 9 Fahrenheit to 5 centigrade. <clears throat> but probably I don't recommend that. Probably at this stage in the course, you're better off just with a handful of formulas. Any questions? Turns out that in chemistry, <clears throat> centigrade isn't good enough. By the time you get to what are known as the gas law problems, you're going to have to dump centigrade and go to something called Kelvin. Kelvin, you've all heard of absolute zero. Okay? Absolute zero is zero Kelvin. So that's where that comes from. <clears throat> like we just said, water boils at 32, I'm sorry, freezes at 32, boils at 212 Fahrenheit. That's zero to 100 centigrade Kelvin. It freezes at 273 and boils at 370. Now those are odd numbers. Why 273 and 373? It has to do with the definition of absolute zero. And you'll get that much later in the course. But the important thing to note here is that this is 100, isn't it? So the size of the degrees are the same. That means you can take any centigrade number and convert it to Kelvin just by adding 273. So the conversion is very simple. They differ by 273 degrees, but the size of the degree is the same. 100 degrees, 100 degrees. All right, what we're going to do is a very simple conversion table here. And we're going to use equations. Here's our handful of equations. Now, I don't know if Professor Bodner is going to give you these. I don't know that. I will. But I don't know if he does. <clears throat> I also allow everyone to bring a 3x5 card. 
to an exam with anything in the world you want written on it. Now that's why training you to write small is important. But again, I don't know his policy on that. But here's our set of equations anyway. If we are given 102 Fahrenheit, and I ask you what that is in centigrade, take out your calculator and do it. We are given a Fahrenheit, and we want centigrade. All right, so we take our Fahrenheit number as 102, gonna subtract 32 from it, divide that by 1.8, and we get 38.9 centigrade. Three significant figures, three significant figures. Now convert 38.9 centigrade to Kelvin. Kelvin, centigrade, plus 273. Well, that's simply enough. I can do it. <coughs> 38.9 plus 273, three figures, 3.12. I see this was fun. <clears throat> Here you're given centigrade. Let's convert that to Fahrenheit. So 1.8 times 22.5, add 32, and we're at 72.5. Now the really easy one, centigrade to Kelvin. Again, Kelvin is going to be centigrade plus 273. And our last one, we are now given Kelvin. What we want to do first is convert this to centigrade, and then centigrade to Fahrenheit. Well, Kelvin to centigrade is simple. That's this guy. Kelvin is always 273 more than centigrade, so just subtract it. Kelvin minus 273 minus 225. Now if we don't centigrade, we want to go to Fahrenheit. We're looking at this one here. 
1.8 times centigrade, and then we're going to add 32. And we're at minus 373. So make sure you get a feel for these numbers, for those equations. Once again, I'm not writing their exam. I don't know what it's going to put on there, but these are very standard conversions. In terms of science, in terms of chemistry, the ones you really need to worry about is centigrade and Kelvin, and that's real simple. All right, our last topic here is density. Density is a fairly simple concept. We have a substance. The substance has a certain mass. I'm going to call it that mass in grams. It also has a given volume. It occupies so much volume. I'm going to measure that in cubic centimeters. This ratio is going to be defined as density. In general, you could define it as any mass for any unit volume. So you could do this in pounds per cubic foot. Mass per unit volume. We won't do that, I assure you. But you could. This is one cubic centimeter. It's a cube, one centimeter on every side. A unit that we use a lot in chemistry is a liter. A liter contains exactly 1,000 cubic centimeters. So the two are directly related. If we have one cubic centimeter, that's one one thousandth of that, we call that a milliliter. Remember, milli is 10 to the minus 3, so that's one one thousandth of a liter. Abbreviated M, uppercase L. When you measure liquids in lab, and we will, you're going to measure these in milliliters. Remember, one milliliter is exactly one cubic centimeter. That's by definition. All right. If I tell you I have a lump of gold, and that lump of gold is one cubic centimeter, and I weigh it, and it weighs 19.3 grams, what is its density? Simply mass divided by its volume. Its mass is 19.3 grams. Its volume is one cubic centimeter. 19.3 grams per cubic centimeter. And that's all density is. All right, let's look at some stuff. <clears throat> People will often say water has a density of one gram per cubic centimeter. It does at 4 degrees centigrade, but at room temperature, which is about 25, it's actually less 0.996, but close enough to 1. Mercury. Back in the old days, we used to be able to play with mercury in lab. It was fun. Nice and shiny and silver and heavy. Um, now it's considered a neurotoxin. Can't do it. Very dense, 13.5 grams per cubic centimeter. Sulfur, about two. Iron, 7.8 grams per centimeter. Note these gases, they're very, very low, aren't they? 0 0.001 grams per cubic centimeter. And the winner in the periodic table is osmium. Osmium is a funny-looking metal, 
Uh, doesn't conduct electricity very well, um, but it's very dense. 22.56 grams per cubic centimeter. Quite often when you have a very small density, like for gases, instead of doing it grams per cubic centimeter, we'll multiply it by a thousand and do grams per meter. Now, this is going to be a little movie of something that's just kind of cute. This is the gentleman, and he's holding a cannonball. Cannonball is essentially pure iron. This thing in front of him is a giant puddle of mercury. Now, I hope he's holding his breath, because it is a neurotoxin. <clears throat> he's going to take and drop the cannonball into the mercury. Oh, come on. Oh, come on. <laughs> Sometimes PowerPoint does this just to aggravate me. Oh gosh, it's not going to let me play it. Oh, yes, it will. Okay. Well, it was supposed to. Well, shoot. Oh, well, I will tell you the uh, what happens. He takes and he drops the cannonball into the mercury and it floats. Now, you don't see cannonballs float on things very often. The reason it floats is because the density of iron at 7.8 is less than mercury at 13.5. Less dense things float on more dense things. Kind of a neat, neat little movie. I'll try to get it to run tomorrow or Wednesday or whatever. All right, let's do a calculation here. We have 250 cubic centimeters of a gas, and it weighs 0.45 grams. What is the density? Okay. We can do this two ways. We'll see if we can use our given ratio method. Or we can just take the very simple formula. Density is mass per unit volume. So that's mass divided by volume. In this problem, it's much simpler just to take D equals mass of volume, plug it in, and do the division. Our mass here is 0.45 grams. Our volume is 250 centimeters, cubic centimeters. Do our division. Our units will be grams per cubic centimeter. And our density is 0 0.0018. 
Okay, this next one is kind of a fun one. <clears throat> Here I have a rock. Now the rock is irregular. You have no idea what the volume of this rock is. But we just happen to have a graduated cylinder sitting around with some water in it. And we note that we're going to start off here at 22.5 millimeters. Now, I go and I add my water. When I do, the level of the bottom goes up, of course. The amount that it goes up is exactly equal to the volume of the rock. So we can get our volume by taking our final measurement here, 45.6, and subtracting from our original, 22.5. So what's the density of the rock? Well, before we do that, this is based on Archimedes. <clears throat> long, long time ago, he was given the task of determining if the king's crown was truly gold. Okay? Well, you can't very well take the crown and melt it down and make a cube out of it, can you? So the story is, he crawled in the bathtub one day, it was full, and the water overflowed. And he said, quote, Eureka! That means, I got it. So we put the crown in, just like we did our rock, measured its volume, and determined if it was gold. All right, we know the mass, but not the volume. We can do that by looking at the volume of the water it displaces. Mass divided by volume. Our mass is 43 grams. Our volume is a difference from where we started to where we ended. Forty-three grams, twenty-three point one milliliters. Now, when we do this division, we're going to get a density. <clears throat> density here. I've converted milliliters to cubic centimeters. If I can do that, they're the same. One point eight six grams per cubic centimeter. Could have left it milliliters and written this, 1.86 grams per mil. <clears throat> what I wanted to show here is a shorthand that's often used, very often used, in science. And that is when you have something divided by something else. Instead of putting in the little division slash, you simply change the exponent from positive to negative. So this is grams divided by cubic centimeter, or grams per cubic centimeter. You will see both. Quite often on word processors, it's easier to do this. So you will probably see this on exams and whatever. Remember, the minus exponent is just the same as the division. Ethanol has a density of 0.79 grams per cubic centimeter. If we have 15 cubic centimeters, it's our mass. Now this one I want to solve using the ratio method. If we were to look at this problem, what's our given? We are given. 15 cubic centimeters of ethanol. What in the world are we going to use for a ratio? Our density is a ratio, isn't it? Grams divided by centimeters. So here we convert 
this or simply rewrite it as a simple ratio. Now we want given, we want cubic centimeters in our denominator. Our cubic centimeters are going to cancel. Do our simple math, 15 times 0.79, 11.8. We have three significant figures here, four significant figures here. We have to round this to three significant figures. I guess I gave that away. What I want to point out here, once again, is the one. This is a, again, it's a unit, it's a definition. It's exactly one, and it doesn't count. The number up top does, but the number one here does not. All right, this of mercury is this. We have 999 grams. What's our volume? Let's do this using the formula. Density is mass divided by volume. All we're going to do is take our formula and solve for volume. Mass divided by volume. That means volume is mass divided by density, right? Okay, substitute in. Our mass is 999 grams. Our density is 13.5 grams per cubic centimeter. Now you look at this, <clears throat> clearly we have grams here and grams here, right? They're going to cancel. What happens to our centimeter? The unit centimeter is in the denominator of the denominator. That is, it's a reciprocal of a reciprocal. We have 1 over 1 over centimeter. So what we're doing is taking this number and flipping it over twice. We wind up with centimeter. Whenever you have reciprocal like this in your denominator, it's going to come up. Hello, there it comes. It's a centimeter cube number. One over, one over is the same as what you started with. All right, so we got this done. Do our simple math 999 divided by 13.5, 73.7 cubic centimeters. Now, just to show how versatile we are, let's do this using given find. We are given 999. <clears throat> Here's our ratio. And we're trying to find cubic centimeters. Set it up. And take 9.99 and multiply it by a ratio. Oops. We 
look at that and say, wait a minute, wait a minute, I did it wrong. Grams has to be in the denominator, right? So just take it, flip it upside down. There, that works. Now grams will cancel. And of course we get the same answer. Now, if the uh, um, Cannonball movie would have worked, this one would, would be trivial. This is oil and water. Density of liquid A, that's, we'll call this water, is 0.985. Liquid B, that's our oil, 0.873. Which liquid is going to float? Again, you have two things. <clears throat> the less dense one will float on the more dense. B, oil, floats on water. Let's do one more problem here using our ratio method. In lab, if I tell you you need two grams of acetone, this is kind of like a real problem. This is what you might do in organic. You need two grams of acetone. You know its density. What volume do you need? You don't want to weigh it out. You just want to measure out the volume. So look at this. Identify your given. Identify your ratio. Well, the given is going to be our two grams, isn't it? Our ratio is just our density. And we have to remember to flip this so that grams is in the denominator. So step one, here's our given. Turn this guy upside down, put it here. You know you've done it right if your units cancel. And our simple math, 2 divided by 0.79, 2.53 cubic centimeters. We would actually measure that as milliliters. always wonders what in the world is this going to be like on an exam, right? Again, unfortunately, sadly, I'm not writing your exam, but here are some exam questions from the past. <clears throat> These are multiple choice, but they do involve calculation. So let's just practice doing a half dozen of these. We have a substance with 93 grams. Its density is 1.46. What's the volume? And these really are real old exam questions.
Well, let's keep it simple. Density is mass divided by volume, isn't it? We know a density, and we know a mass. So we're simply going to solve for volume. Plug in our density, plug in our mass, rearrange. 93 divided by 1.46. 63.7 cubic centimeters. Take your basic formulas, all for volume. Plug it in, do the math. We have 51.2 mils of something with a density of 145. What's the mass? I took my, vo my volume here. I changed mills to cubic centimeters just because I can. Here's my density. And I set it so that centimeters cancel. Multiply them together. I'm going to get my mass. If you want to do it the other way, we're solving it for mass. Point things in. Solve for mass. And we get 74.24 grams. There's 74.24, right? That's wrong, because we have three significant figures. We must round to this guy. <clears throat> well, this one's a killer. Seven mils and a mass of so many milligrams. So I can get a density, can't I? Milligrams per mil. But this asks for kilograms per mil. So we're going to have to convert milligrams to kilograms, aren't we? Let's go ahead and just do it the simple way. Density is mass divided by volume. So we have a mass and we have a volume. <clears throat> Plug it in. 56.87 milligrams per mil. That's a density, isn't it? How many kilograms per mil is this? Well, <clears throat> we've got a couple here with the same numbers, and of course we also have the dreaded number above. 5687 milligrams is how many kilograms? Uh, 
<clears throat> remember, milligrams to gram, that's a factor of a thousand. So you can do this in your head. This is going to be 5.6 grams. Grams to kilograms is another factor of a thousand. So we just move our decimal over three places, 0569, and that's where we are. Let's skip this one because it's pretty much the same. That's the same one. I don't know how that got in there twice. What I want to show you here is, as soon as I get there, something called density one and density two. If you want practice doing conversions from mass, volume, and density, this is a very simple thing to do. Go to this tutorial. And this you're just given a table with one thing missing. So let's all take our calculators. If we have a mass of 24.8 grams, a volume of 18 cubic centimeters, what's our density? we have to do is take our mass, divide by our volume, that gives us density, doesn't it? Mass divided by volume, 1.37 grams per cubic centimeter. One thing is you have to remember on the tutorials here, you never ever enter units, only numbers, because it's grading numbers. You can't read units only grade numbers. Do this again. Here I've given you a mass and a density. Calculate the volume quickly. Our volume is going to be mass divided by density. Plug in our mass, plug in our density. Remember, cubic centimeters comes up top. 51.5. Here's volume, here's density. Calculate mass. Mass is simply going to be density multiplied by volume. Here's our density. Here's our volume. Multiply them together. 54.7. Now that one, like I said, is <clears throat> lovingly referred to as density one. If you go through density one and it works for you, you can do these, you understand what you're doing, try density two. 
density two combines the same calculations we do here, except the metric conversions are also built in. So in this case, we're looking for a volume in cubic centimeters. We are given a mass in kilograms, but our density here is in milligrams. So the way you want to do this is, okay, I've got to convert these two into each other. Kilograms to gram, milligram to gram. Once you do that, you're all set. <clears throat> we can do this in our head. Kilo is a thousand, milli is 10 to the minus 3. So we can just do these conversions easily. Our mass in kilograms is 1.68 pounds. Our density in milligrams is 9.5 grams. All we're doing is moving our decimal. And again, we can do that in our head. Plug it in. Rearrange, we're solving for volume, mass divided by density, and it should be 0.176. Now, every time you click the little button here, new problem, you get a new problem. All new numbers, new words, everything. Really nice way to review once you get the concept going. Any questions? Let's just wind it up here with one last test question. Again, this is based on density two. Looking for a mass in milligrams, we have a density in grams. Are given here 9.91 cubic centimeters, that's our volume. Our ratio, <clears throat> 3248 grams per, well, here I changed liter to 1,000 cubic centimeters. I did that in my head too. So the cubic centimeters would cancel. Now all I have to do is multiply it out and get my answer in grams. I could do it this way. Solve for my mass, and I get 32 grams. Oh, oh, come on, come on. You're not supposed to do that to me. 32 grams is how many milligrams? Multiply by a thousand. So that's 32,000. Now, how many significant figures do we have? Three. Three significant figures. Therefore, this is going to have to be rounded to three significant figures. This has five, this has three, that's the correct answer.